I'll try it. Headset. It's on though. I mean, it's it's it's. People are just coming in. I don't know what I did wrong. But it's not hooked up to my. This. Talks to me. Says you're connected. Bad battery full. No, oh, I bet I'm not. Nice. I'm 
Hey. There we go. We hear Julie. Why is this not working? There we go. Maybe that'll do. It. Check one, two. There we go. Hey. All right. That works. So that works. So this works. The projector works this week. Now, if I can just get it to launch the meeting. Uh, Becky, I know, was logged in, so she's probably got her screen black. Got eight minutes. We can get this, right? You're the guy speaking today, huh? Madison now works for God sticking in yes. Um, if we had a local, I'd probably do it more. Last week. Uh, they call echo. Why can I talk? I'm not muted.
Not the way I want to do this. Did he behave? He is. Hey, Barb. <laughs> Um, I'm probably going to say it's not. Why do you hate the other than the fact that it's not working? I don't know. I've never tried it on edge. I've never had it. I think there's a part of me that at first I moved to my home because I didn't want to be able to do the entire thing with my That's why I used to use Firefox, but then they did something that made it almost impossible to use Firefox. Okay. We made this. I got this on a Black Friday sale five years ago. It, everything is functioning, it just doesn't want to be even quicker. Did it finally? It's loaded on my tablet. That's where. Hey, Melissa. Hi, my friend. It's been set up for two weeks. No. Well, all right. I see Crystal, I see Becky, I see Amy, but if I do it on my phone, it kicked me off the tablet. Because you can only do one mobile device at a time. And it is very slowly loading it on the computer for whatever reason. Yes, I think so.
<sighs> well, um, this might continue to load. It might. I got the projector working this week, and the sound system worked this week, but struggling to get. It says it's recording. Yes, Crystal, that, that's a good thing, too. Maybe we'll actually have a recording this week. It's going to look really bad, but. <sighs> no, I'm not certain that it's not the Internet service. In fact, I'm pretty sure it probably is the Internet service, but it also probably is a six year old computer. You know, they don't last that long anymore, but um for time's sake we're already two after seven and i missed you guys last week we had a great time down in tennessee that people were allowing us to go and do that get refreshed um so uh but with that let's go to the lord prayer. almighty god there is so much going on in the world death violence disease and yet you invite us to find peace, hope, love, and life in you. So, Lord, be amongst us wherever we might be in this moment. Lord, be amongst us as we dig into your word. Lord, may your spirit pervade our conversation and fill us to overflowing with, with your presence. Lord, that these words on these pages might be your words to our hearts. And Lord, that we might hear from you clearly tonight. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So last time, which didn't get report recorded, I'm sorry for that. We ended at verse 16 of chapter 4, correct? We're ready for verse 17. Um, so we get to move into some the next chapter and a half or so might go quickly might not depending on what we find in here but uh for those of you who are new i don't we got a handful of new um the way i do this is we read a paragraph at a time you can ask any question whatsoever is this true any question whatsoever and we'll chase the rabbit and if we get too far down the rabbit hole we can shoot it and come back but the reality for me is i really want us to see this is our story. And if it's our story, then we need to know our story. And in order to know our story, we have to be willing to ask questions of our story because we don't remember this. And so we have to make it an active part of our memory. And so in order to do that, we must dig in and we must see it for what it is. So with that caveat, my first paragraph is 17 through 22. Does anybody else have a different paragraph that's shorter than that? Then we'll read that and let's see what happens. All right. Genesis chapter four, verse 17. Cain knew his wife and she conceived and bore Enoch and he built a city and named it Enoch after, after his son. Woohoo! At least we know it's recording. <laughs> to Enoch was born Irad and Irad was a father of Mehuyel. And Mahuyel was a father of Methushel, and Methushel was a father of Lamech. Lamech took two wives. The name of one wife was Ada, and the name of the other was Scylla. Ooh, better mute that. Oh, pause.
I'll unmute that so you guys can hear me and we'll move forward. Um, so what, anyway, all right, back to scripture. The craziness of technology. So what stood out other than the fact that you had shorter paragraphs that I still would have read the names to, but do you notice anything? Cain built a city. Um, so he isn't wandering the earth like he was afraid he was going to have to, right? God granted some grace in that, actually. Um, what else do you notice? Ah, there you go. We have here our first, I guess you'd say, polygamous marriage. It doesn't say that it's good. It doesn't say it's bad. It just says it is, doesn't it? Of course, we know back from a couple chapters back, God made it man and woman. So this is probably going to have some problems to it. Not necessarily, but there's an assumption that there's God's way and there's the wrong way. But um, what else do you notice? Hey, Amy. Anybody else notice anything? So we've got musicians and they're creating instruments. Music comes in, let's see, how, how many generations are we? Adam and Eve, Cain, uh, we get Enoch, Irad, Mahujel, Methushel, Lamech. So in the eighth generation, at least, we've got music. There you go. So we've got lots of different careers, the fields, the livestock, the working with metals and iron, uh, those who live in tents, they live in tents and have livestock. That's a, that's a different kind of thing, isn't it? Say that again. Teachers in Enoch. Um, I don't think I catch what you're saying there. Maybe I'm missing it. The, oh, oh, the name Enoch means teaching. As we said a couple of weeks ago, the reality is every name has meaning. And there's a part of me that would love to go through the list and just chase down every name and what it means. And if there's stories we have behind them. Um, but the reality is, I think the biggest thing is we're actually seeing the beginnings of what God asked of humanity to go forth, to spread his image across the globe, to have dominion on the earth and to care for it. So we have people living in tents, they're caring for livestock. So it's different than the shepherding kind of, you know, that we had with, with Cain and Abel, um, we've got people who are discovering what's deep in the ground, finding ways to work with bronze and iron. This changes the story, doesn't it? These are not, I mean, by our standards, they might be primitive, but these are not primitive people. If you can create musical instruments and you're domesticating animals and you're inventing ways to build tents and you're, you're learning how to forge you know, metals, that's, that's some pretty advanced things going on here. And the reason why I think that's important is because this is still before the flood, is it not? The reality is we have this notion that people 3,000, 4,000 years ago were extremely primitive. And maybe compared to this technology that I can't get to work in front of me, <laughs> they might be primitive, 
But by the same token, they're extremely advanced and they've advanced really quickly. It's nowhere close to the timeline that we get from our modern history books. Now, we don't know the timeline realistically yet, do we? We don't know how much time has passed. We just know this generation begat this generation, this generation begat this generation. But the truth of the matter is, eight generations, if they're like us today, you put 20 years, that's 160 years. A lot has happened in 160 years. I mean, a lot has happened in the last 160 years, has it not? And so you can see this reality where we might think people back then were very primitive, but I think that being closer to the original intent, closer to the original design, they're far more advanced than what we give them credit for. Now, that might be a good thing and it might not, we don't know yet, but it's evident that things are moving forward. Knowledge has been given, they're learning, they're growing things, you know, things are changing for humanity. Anybody else notice something? Ah, yes. We have a sister mentioned as well, Naima. Now, I don't know that we get any description of Naima other than the fact that she exists, but it's interesting outside of Eve, this is the first female mentioned that's been born. We have these two wives, they're given names, and we have this one daughter that's given names. I'm surprised nobody has asked this question yet over the last couple of weeks, but the traditional question we would have gotten by now is, where did their wives come from if they're having kids? Um, according to Jewish tradition, this is Jewish tradition, that doesn't mean it's true, it doesn't mean it's false, it's just tradition. Adam and Eve actually had 25 children. Of course, one is murdered, and then there are 12 sets of kids. And they all marry and they have their own kids. Now, that's kind of convenient because, of course, the number 12 is kind of important to Jewish people. So we don't know if that's true or not, but still 25 kids is a lot of kids. The reality is the prohibition against marrying someone close to you that we have today didn't exist at this point. The reason we actually have that rule is because of genetics. We know that when you marry someone who is genetically very close to you, it amplifies any negative genetic markers in the person which is why in the United States, almost universally, you have to be at least third cousins to be married. It creates enough genetic diversity that hopefully any birth defects will be minor, if at all. Um, of course, if you, uh, we've been watching a lot of uh, historical fiction and things like that. And so if you look at monarchs in particular, they get really intermarried and it, it is not always good. <laughs> But at this point in time, they're still pretty close to the original design, are they not? I mean, one of the things that I've always said is I believe God made us perfect when he made us. We know it was very good. And I think we had complete control over our body all the way down to the molecular level to where our, even our genetic code, we had control over. And so there wasn't this concern about things breaking down. It's not going to be for thousands of years even before we get to this. It's not going to be until you get to Exodus and, and we have the Ten Commandments and then God lays down his, the law that we begin to see. No, it's really not good for you to be closely related and to get married. So we need to understand moving forward for at least the rest of the book of Genesis, while for us, that's going to sound really weird. I'm definitely glad I did not marry my sister. <laughs> I mean, technically she's my half sister, but still that's, you know, for us, that just, that's just wrong, right? But this is a different time, a different era, a different reality.
Uh, why do you think he had two wives? Well, I would hope that he liked both of them, but I think probably Chris's note answer might be a little closer. What's so he could have more children. Why would he want to have more children? Make more important, make them work for it. What else do you think? Maybe, maybe something about the gene pool. I would, I'm tempted to say my gut reaction is the more kids you have, the more people you have, the more people you have, the more influence you have, the more influence you have, the more power you have. I mean, the larger the clan, the larger the family, the more prominence you have. The more soldiers you can have, the more influence you can press over others. All throughout human history, we see, especially amongst the nobility, this reality of having multiple wives so that they can make sure that they have an heir and so that they can secure treaties, they can secure power. I would venture to say this has something to do with his power. Now, I said that and I realized I know what's in the next couple of verses. So maybe we ought to read the next couple of verses. 23 and 24. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. You wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech, 77fold. On the one hand, it, it changes things, doesn't it? I was hoping that we wouldn't have this kind of thing again. Of course, we know that's not true. We know evil's going, it, I mean, look at our world today. So he's already committed murder. And depending on how you read it, he may have either committed one murder or two, right? And the thing of it is, is he's not even committing murder for what would be even mildly justifiable reasons, is it? This guy wounded me, so I killed him. This guy struck me, so I killed him. That, that's not good, is it? And the thing of it is, with Cain, he had the conversation with God, right? Even though he never repented, even though he never admitted that he was wrong, he at least had a conversation with God, and God says, no, I won't let anyone kill you because then this will, you will be avenged. But Lamech is taking it on himself. Is He's just proclaiming his own curse. This isn't God's curse. It's Lamech's curse. Because... And he wasn't, exactly, that we know of, because God, God said that reality. And I guess to a certain degree, maybe people were still actually afraid of God. And I guess Lamech in this instance is trying to invoke this at a multiplied level to imply he's even more powerful or more important than Cain was. The arrogance of the human heart, right? What else do you notice? Anything about this story? I guess he's telling his wives that to bear witness, uh, to be witnesses of this curse that he has pronounced. Um, I don't know. It's such a strange story, isn't it? Why do you think a story like this would be in our scripture? You had to guess. Okay. To, to see how the deceit and lies have spread 
And I just realized there's chat. Um, I think that's probably the biggest reason why we see this story is it is a reminder to us that we, um, we're in a place where this evil is spreading. And in eight generations, you go from one man who killed his brother to a man who just kills for almost nothing. And then on top of it, pronounces his own curse out of his own authority. This is probably the first curse that's uttered by human lips too. It's at least the first one we have recorded. What you think, Myra? Right. The further we move away, and uh, Mindy, I was expecting you to ask your question. You've been asking the last couple of weeks. Uh, you and Chris have kind of asked that question. There's no repentance here. There's no one turning to God in this. There's no one claiming, I made a mistake. I've done something wrong. And so it is this multiplication of the evil of humanity that's going on here. Anything else? It absolutely sounds like today. Doesn't it? Let's finish the chapter. 25. Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another child instead of Abel, because Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, and he named him Enosh. At that time, people began to invoke the name of the Lord. Uh, our first reprieve, something different. <laughs> Some of them seem to be getting a conscience, yeah. So it goes, Adam, who fell from grace, Seth, and Enosh takes at least two more generations before someone gets over the shame and starts to call on the name of the Lord. Isn't that sad? By the same token, don't we all know families that are like that, where you have one generation that's a black mark and it takes two or three more generations before anyone seems to break that cycle. I wish it worked as strongly the other way as it does that way, but it doesn't seem to, does it? You can do everything right by your kids and some of them will still choose to do something the wrong way. The good news is, is for me, these two little verses, especially that last verse, is a, is a hope that even when the world is doing everything wrong, there will still be some who call on the name of the Lord. And that's not a lot of hope, but it's some hope, isn't it? And a little hope goes a long way. It at least takes us back. And of course, you know, in the last couple of months, we've seen major fires that came from little bitty sparks, millions of acres. And the reality is, this is the spark that God is looking for. All throughout the scripture, we will read stories of God waiting for someone to call on him. And of course, for the last four chapters, we've been waiting for someone. Please, someone, just admit that you're, you did it wrong and cry out to God. And we haven't had it until just now. 
which is part of the reason why I've said for years, scripture is less a manual for how to do this thing right, and more the story of how we as humanity have done it wrong. And will we learn from those lessons? I mean, yes, there are some of God's rules in here, but far more of this book is about stories of humanity getting it wrong, isn't it? Any thoughts on chapter four or anything else that we've had up to this point? Oh, uh, yeah. So after Cain kills Abel, we don't see God conversing with man like he did. So he walked with Adam and Eve. He walked with them in the garden. Cain and Abel, he conversed with them. But there seems to be this gradual distancing. Now, let me ask that question. If there's a distancing, who's doing the distancing? We are. We'll see time and time again where God pushes in. We're the ones who push away. I mean, even in the Cain story, remember, God says you'll wander the earth. Cain's the one who takes himself past Eden. He's the one who flees to a far land. We are the ones who constantly move away from God. We flee from God. And yet God continues to walk to us. Any other thoughts before we go into chapter five? <sighs> Amy, uh, say a little bit more about your question there. Could he have been setting the stage for the curse that may be coming their way? I may have missed your comment earlier on, so I don't know when you asked the question. When he confessed to his two wives that he had killed somebody. That went really fast. Try that again. When he confessed to his wives that he had killed somebody, was oh. he setting them up for the, what the price they may be paying by the death of their children? As a... Oh, wow. Yeah, no, that's a really, so you bring up two things there. One, he actually is confessing that he has killed someone. So we do have our first confession, but it's not a confession towards repentance, is it? it? The other side of that is, Amy, you're right. There's this reality of retribution. He's kind of warning his wives in this that evil might be coming their way. Good catch there, Amy. Good catch. Any other thoughts? You ready to dig into chapter five? All right. Chapter five. Verses one and two. This is the list of descendants of Adam when God created humankind. He made them in the likeness of God, male and female, he created them. And he blessed them and named them humankind when they were created. So bare minimum, we see a shift here, don't we? We're moving away from the story to do something different. What else does this make you think? Anything? Keep going then? Oh, well, let me take a step back. Um, mankind is what I think it says in uh, within the ancient Hebrew. Three words. You know, I talked to you a little bit about the Hebrew language, how it's only got like 900 roots and words are interrelated. Adam is a proper name. Adama uh, is the word for humanity, the people of Adam. Adam is the word for ground or earth. So humanity was taken out of the earth and Adam is the man of the earth. There is always going to be an interconnectionality between Adam, humanity, Adamah, and the ground. We were made for this world on purpose. 
And we'll see that playing out throughout the rest of the story as well. So just a little tidbit there. Any other thoughts before I read chapter verse three? Three through five, it looks like is my next paragraph. When Adam lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his likeness, according to his image, and he named him Seth. The days of Adam after he became the father of Seth were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Okay, you guys interested in seeing this? Anybody want to be my scribe? Do I want to do this? or? So, how long did Adam live? 930. Okay, how long did he live before he had a son? He got 130 years, and what was the son's name? Seth. Okay. So we have a 130 year gap between the start of Adam and Seth, right? Okay. We're going to track this. I'm going to pull this back, I guess. Any questions on that, or is that, it's pretty straightforward, isn't it, so far? Okay, when Seth had lived 105 years, he, he became the father of Enosh. Seth lived after the birth of Enosh 807 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. So Seth lived 912, right? How old was he whenever he was 105? Five, and his son was Enosh. Say that again. Well, the reality is they're they're following a line here, but they have other sons and daughters. So each of them, Adam had other sons and daughters other than Cain, Abel, and Seth, but they're not mentioned. Their names aren't. Seth has other sons and daughters other than Enosh, and we're going to get at least one of them, but for the most part, most of the people aren't mentioned. They don't, they either, they're not germane to the story, they don't do anything to move the story along, they turn evil, which Probably is a case. I mean, let's face it, most people we've met so far have not been all that great. <laughs> Just saying. So we don't know who they are, but the other sons and daughters just are that. It's a reality that this isn't just a clone. This isn't, I pop out another kid. The reality is there are other people being born. We just, they're just not, we just don't get their names. Does that make sense? Well, so that, so she asked it, could it be the firstborn? That could be the case. Um, I mean, after all, we know down the road, the firstborn gets most of the uh, power and authority in a family. But I don't think that's probably the case here because it doesn't say that. And the other side of it is, is I don't think that reality of the power dynamics has developed yet in the world. Does that make sense? We, we haven't heard anything say that. We know that about the ancient Hebrew culture, but this is before that. And at some point in time, we'll probably see that play in. But so that's a good question. It'll be interesting to see when we finally notice this reality of the firstborn son being more important. That's something worth keeping our eyes on. So, so far between the, the birth of Adam and the birth of Enosh, we actually have... 235 years, right? Give or take. Uh, this is probably a good time for me to, before we get too much further, for me to talk a little bit about how the Jewish people count years. So if you were born January 1st at 12.01 in the morning, when's your birthday? January 1st. For the Jewish people, they would say that you were born in January, 
that you were born on the first. So you could claim the first as your birthday. You could claim January as your birthday, but you could also claim the entire year as your birthday. They are less concerned with the specificity that we are when it comes to dates like that. Now, there will be times all throughout scripture. I mean, I just read in the prophets and they use some very specific dates. But when it comes to age, if you've lived one second in a year, you live that year. So, for instance, we, we would say if you were born at 1201, but what if you died at 1201 on January 1st? Most of us would say, really, you didn't live in the, that year, would we? We'd kind of, I mean, on a technicality, but we wouldn't really count it, would we? In fact, um, we go so far as to, we want to make sure you're alive during most of the year. Chris over here has to deal with taxes. And if you don't have that person living in your household for over half the year, you can't count them as a tax deduction, can you? That's how we think, isn't it? You have to have been alive for the preponderance of a period in order for that to count. You know, it could be that Adam was born January 1st, and it could be that Seth was born December 31st of his 130th year. And so it could be actually a lot longer than 130 years in our estimation. But that's not what's really important here. So we have, at this point in time, we have a, a margin of plus or minus two years, right? Because it could be just a couple of, it, this, it could be born January 1st, January 1st, January 1st. And so it's technically 235 years, but maybe it's just like 233 and two days. You get what I'm saying? But that's, it's not as, in, this part right here is not as important, but I just want to point out a reality. They consider if you can claim part, you can claim the whole. That's not the way we think in our world. If you can only claim part, you only claim part. Where this will play in, for instance, is uh, on Sunday morning, we've been reading in Matthew's gospel. And Joseph, is Joseph the father of Jesus? So... Dean's shaking his head no. Melissa's saying yes and no. Anybody else willing to try and answer? In our way of thinking, the way we approach things in our world today, Jesus was not Joseph's son. Genetically, they were not related. At best, we could say he was a stepson, right? That's what we would call that relationship. But that relationship didn't exist in Joseph's world. In fact, throughout all of scripture, that relationship didn't exist. You were either a son or you were not. Period. And if the father claimed a child, they were his. Period. You didn't have to have birth certificates and social security numbers to prove. Just didn't. So when they can claim part of a year, they can claim all of the years. They can claim part of the land. They can claim all of the land. And that, that changes the story a little bit because that's not how our culture thinks, is it? We, we think in very precise measurements. We think in very precise claims. If you can claim this, you know, I now live in Decatur. So all of Decatur is mine. Sorry, guys. I've claimed it. It's mine. Did any of you claim it before me? Sorry. Nope. Didn't hear it. It's mine. We don't think that way, do we? It's not the way it works for us. But there's also this reality where we live in a world where resources are far more scarce. Even though we live in America where there's abundance of land and abundance of resources, it's still not that plentiful that everybody can just have whatever they want, it, is it? I mean, for the, us, the last year and a half has taught us that. Go to the store and the shelves are half empty. Some of the stuff you want is just not there. Sorry, you didn't get there fast enough, it's gone. But at this point in time in human history, they have the entire world at their disposal. And so it's a little different. And we have to keep that in mind as we read the stories. So whenever you, whenever you come across something and it doesn't quite measure up, 
ask yourself those questions. What is it different about this culture? Why would they think that that's an okay way of doing things? Does that make sense? All right. Any other things? We I need to shoot the rabbit and come back. What, what verse are we at? Verse nine. When Enosh had lived 90 years, he became the father of Kenan. So we got Kenan, K-E-N-A-N. -E -N. He lived 90. We had 90. This is 325 plus or minus. And Enosh lived how many years total? 905. 905. Well, look at that. So Adam lives 930, Seth 912, Enosh 905. We're already starting to see something there, aren't we? That death that was promised, it's coming a little quicker, isn't it? Now, if you're living 900 years and you only lose, what's that, 18? It's not that bad, is it? You could probably spare 18 years out of 930, couldn't you? But here we are, how many generations later? And anybody want an extra 18 years? Anybody want an extra good 18 years? Seven. All right. So Enish lived after the birth of Kenan 850 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enish were 950, and he died. Verse 12, when Kenan had lived 70 years, he became the father of Mahalalel. Kenan lived after the birth of Mahalalel 840 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Kenan were 910 years and he died. So Kenan lived 910. Ooh, he got to live five years longer than his dad did. But how old was he when he had his son? 70. Okay, and his son, oh, that's Mahalalel. M A, okay, who can spell well? H A L A L E L. So we are adding 70 years to this, so now we're up to 395 plus or minus four. Right? Am I double checking my math? Am I doing it right? Chris, math's good? Okay. All right. When Mahalalel had lived 65 years, he became the father of Jared. Mahalalel lived after the birth of Jared 830 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Mahalalel were 895. He died. Ooh, he got 15 less than his dad. 895. And his son was Jared, right? J A R E D. And he was how old when he had Jared? 65. 65. So now we are up to 460 plus or minus 5. Look at this. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 generations. Anybody live to see 6 generations? Anybody? Adam and Eve are still alive. It lived 930 years. We're only at 465, maybe 465 if we had it all. How many people do you think are on the world at this point in time? Just a thought. All right. 18. When Jared had lived 162 years, 162, he became the father of Enoch. Jared lived after the birth of Enoch 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Jared were 962 years and he died. So he lived 962 and he gave birth to Enoch. So we got 162 on top of this. So now we're up to 622 plus or minus. Enoch's living. Notice how old, how old was Adam? Adam's still alive. Man, can you imagine? Grandkids, great. Two, three, fourth great grandkids you get to see. Anything out of the ordinary yet? Keep going. 
Okay, 21. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after the birth of Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, then was no more, because God took him. Ah. So Enoch lived how many years before he had a son? 65. That brings us up to 687 plus or minus 7. And his son is Methuselah, right? Uh, M E T H U S T L A. But Enoch lived how many years? 365. It does not say he died. Twice it says he walked with God. This guy is something different. We don't have a whole lot about Enoch's story. Uh, Enoch will play in in a lot of things. Uh, there are a couple of books that are attributed to this Enoch, a man who was extremely godly, who was so godly, in fact, that God says you don't need to taste death. He didn't die. He just was no more. Essentially, yes. So I get. I guess I got a good re spiritual retirement plan for you all. Anybody not want to die? You guys want to die? Anybody? You seriously? You all want to die? You might want to bypass death altogether. Now, there's only one condition. You got to walk with God perfectly. Any of us going to qualify? It doesn't say that he walked with God perfectly, but it says that he walked with God and was no more. So a couple of generations back here with Enosh, his son, grandson, great, great, trip, his Second great grandfather was the first one to call the name of the Lord since had been kicked out of the kingdom. So we have kicked out, right? Nothing there. And then we have calling God. Nothing there, nothing there, nothing. There. There and then we have to walk with God. So even though humanity is moving on, even though time is progressing, there is also a subtle development here of humanity trying to reclaim what God had intended. And it's just kind of tucked in there. If you just kind of were reading over this, if we weren't doing it line by line by line, we may actually have missed that, Mike, we have. Because I was intentionally charting this out, we paid attention to those verses. And otherwise, you might have, we might have missed that reality. That tucked in there amidst all of the evil in the world, tucked in there amidst all these names that may or may not mean anything for us, there are some people who are calling on God and there are some people who are actually walking with God. Now, we could lament the fact that it seems like most of humanity is not. We could do that, right? We'd probably be justified to do that. But think of the great hope that exists in that amidst all the evil in the world, there are some who are choosing a very different path. And if they chose that path, could we not choose that path? You may have had parents that were great. You may have had parents that were horrible. But you don't have to choose their path. You may live in a broken world where 
people are denying the reality of God, who don't want anything to do with God, who refuse to call on the name of God. But you can call on God. And amongst the living and dying, the, the giving birth, the working our jobs, the everything else we do, there are some who are choosing a better path. And not only are they choosing a better path to walk with God, but God paid attention. God saw that what he was doing and rewarded him for it. In a world where we almost say, does God really even see what's happening around us? Does God pay any attention to the evil in this world? Tucked in the middle of these verses, we get the story that says, yes, God does pay attention. God absolutely pays attention. And on the one hand, that scares me to no end. <laughs> but on the other hand, it gives me great hope. And I hope that it does for you. You get what I'm saying? And it's just one little verse tucked in there, isn't it? A, a verse we could just pass over and not even give two thoughts about. Okay. Generation. So, if we were to go up here and we were to list the seven generations of Cain, we have Lamech, who is evil to no end. He kills a person for wounding him. But the seventh generation of Seth is Enoch, who walks with God. Creating a, a dichotomy. It, there are two realities in the world. There is the path of evil that will always lead to death. And there is the path of good that can lead to a different kind of life. You could stop right there, couldn't you? Done. Any other thoughts or questions? So the number seven is often um, titled the number of perfection. It's the number of when God rested from his work. So there's a sense in there which there is completion in the number of seven. So Seth, the second seven calls on God, and at the seventh generation, there's a walking with God again. Where Adam walked with God and fell, Enoch walks with God and is exalted. Exalted is kind of a probably a, a little bit over more abundant than what I'd want to use, but there's a reality where he does what his ancestor failed to do. Lamech does what his ancestor did and multiplies it. Enoch does what his ancestor did not and makes good on it. Any other thoughts? I don't know where we're at on time. We'll get through the chapter. We still got a half an hour. First of all, right. 25. When Methuselah had lived 187 years, he became the father of Lamech. We have another Lamech. Imagine that. I hope he's not named after his relative. Maybe that won't go very good. Methuselah lived after the birth of Lamech 782 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, the days of Methuselah were 969 years he died. So he lives 969, and 
and his son is named what? Lamech. Sorry. See, I got a short attention span. L A M E C H. How old was he when he had him? 182. 182, so now he had 189. 869 plus or minus. Nine. Notice, Lamech's born. How old is Adam? He's at least 869, maybe 878, but he's still living. Adam has seen all of them. Or at least heard the tales of all of this, has not What do you think Adam's thinking? I, I just, just find myself asking that question. When he sees maybe this line with Enoch walking with God, do you think there's something in him that might have sparked? If, if, if my descendant, my child, maybe I can do it again. Or do you think he's more concentrating on Cain's line with Lamech and how evil humanity has gotten. Oh. These are the weird questions I ponder at night. My wife and I have all kinds of strange conversations, she'll tell you. Sometimes she initiates the weirder ones, though. I'll just throw that out there. Verse 28. Make sure we... Amy says here, the line of Christ through David is credited through Joseph. And you're right, it is. She, she learned a lot off. But, you know, the reality is, is it really is about the claiming here. And I'd much rather be a part of this line than you, than Lamech's or Cain's line. And that reality that you point out, that your study Bible points out there, this dichotomy, the, the children of Cain, Versus the children of Seth, we'll see that play out throughout Scripture too. Cain never learns from his lesson, and his descendants get worse. Seth's descendants do learn from their lessons, and they experience God's goodness. Any other thoughts? Twenty-eight. When Lamech had lived 182 years, he became the, fa the father of a son. He named him Noah, saying, Out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the toil of our hands. Lamech lived after the birth of Noah 595 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Lamech were 777 years and he died. So Lamech lived 777. He was how old whenever he had Noah? 182. So we do my math again and 71. So Noah was born in 1051. Maybe 1061, which means Adam did not get to know Noah. You think that's significant? Just ask him. We know who Noah is, right? I mean, there's kind of this. Minor story that is tied to him. I don't know. It kind of goes over what one, two, three, four, four chapters, five chapters, four or five chapters. He's a minor character, it has nothing to do with human history at all. One, two, three, four, five, six. Isn't 10 kind of a good number for us? Don't we consider that kind of an important number? So, is it a punishment on Adam that he didn't get to see no? Maybe.
you know, there's a reality where I hope that part of what happens here is that he keeps Adam from experiencing something that, uh, that is far worse. Um, there is a reality when you do the math, if we were to read ahead, Methuselah, Noah's grandfather, either dies in the flood or just before the flood. Enoch, of course, we know walked with God. He didn't have to experience the flood at all. Enosh, who called on the name of God, is definitely not alive in the flood. There's a reality here where the world gets so bad here in a little bit that God decides to just wipe it clean. And the good generations, Enosh, Enoch, are gone. Even Adam, who walked, who originally knew God face to face, he's gone. Said that the promised line is gone. The world as they know it is lost. These important godly people. Does that sound familiar? I don't know. What's evident is the few people we know who either had a personal relationship with God, heard from God, even Cain himself is gone by this point. Adam, who walked with God, Cain, who heard from God, Seth, who knew God, Enosh, who called on God, Enoch, who walked with God, all of these individuals are gone by the time we get to the flood, which is why in chapter 6, he'll say, God looked at the world and he saw that the thoughts of men were evil continually. Even though there were good people in the world, they weren't having enough of an impact to make a difference, it feels like. And so into that reality, God steps in. Ah, oh, how is that different from today? Well, how is it different from today? Anything different from Noah's day today? What's different? Anybody? Anybody want to take a shot? Anybody want to give the the children's Sunday school answer? What's what's always the answer when the preacher asks you a question? Jesus is different. Um, the reality is that in our world, we are the light. We are the children of light. We are the sons of God. We are the ones who call on God. We are the ones who walk with God. We are the ones who listen to the Spirit. And we are the difference in the world. Yes. The reality of all this evil we're going to see, yes, the realities of Cain's line are alive and well in the world today. It is an evil place. And in some ways, we might even say it seems to be getting worse, doesn't it? There is a sense in which he's, he, is, he is absolutely confessing it, but he's not confessing it in a way that's repentance. We talked about that. It is a bragging of sorts that, that the evil of Cain's line has gone so far, they're killing people just because and they're going to brag about it. And there's a sense when, in which that reality is alive and well in our world, isn't it? That is the condition of the human heart Apart from God, we will be that evil. The sad truth is, is we feel like the world is getting worse. The sad reality is the world has always been that bad. 
The only reason that the world is not that bad is because we have the influence of Christ in us. And we are an influence in the world. When we read this story, it's easy for us to come to a place where we just, man, it's depressing. Because let's just say, let's do math. If Adam had, let's, let's say that he had 25 kids, right? So Adam and Eve is two, and then they had another 24. So that's 12 couples, right? Well, if each of them had 24 kids, so that would be, let's math person. Hold on, Chris. Your calculator dependent. That's really, that's convenient. 12 times 12 is 144. That times two is 288. Uh, 144 times 24. Anybody got a calculator out? Anybody want to? 144. 144 couples times 288. <sighs> what? 140 times. All right, that's jumping a generation. I'm sorry. 144 times 12 or times 24. 144 times 24. 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay, so half of that, if there's that many couples, that's uh, 1728. 1728 times 24. 41,000 what? 472. Oh, but, but let me rephrase this. This isn't, remember, Adam was alive all the way down here, right? So we're adding these together. So that's 26, and that makes 314, and that makes 3,770, and then that makes 40, uh, 2, 4, 1, 3, 5, 2, and another so that's 45,242. Do you start to see a problem here? Okay, so someone take 20,736 uh, times 24. 497, 664, plus that 45242, that gets a 60, <coughs> 552,906. This is generation one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. And Jared, before we ever get to Enoch, there's a potential of a half a million people in the world, right? And that's just Seth's. Well, technically, that's about everybody. I mean, we're, we're guessing that they had 24 kids. Oh, absolutely. Let's, so we're here at Jerry, right? We got one, two, three, four. Let's just do this four more times. Let's see what it comes to. That should be five, four, two, five, four. See, I do math. There's a reason why I stuck to theology, right? Okay, so let's do, take two, nine, seven, six, six, two. Or, sorry, 497, 662 times 6. 664. Yes, thank you. 9 times 6. 2,985,984. 984. And then add to that plus 542, 906. 2,5,8. 800. Okay, and that was now we're at Phoenix generation. We got one, two, three more times to go. So take two nine eight five. 
984 times six. And now add to that three million five hundred twenty-eight thousand eight ninety. Twenty-one million four hundred forty-four thousand eight ninety-four. Okay. So now take we got that's now we're in Methuselah's generation. We've got two more to go. Seventeen nine fifteen. 905, 904, sorry, times 6. 107, 105, 495, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, one last time, got one more generation just to get to notice. Okay, so take 107, 495, 424, times six. 644 million, Okay, add to that 128, 940, 218. So, at the time that Noah was born, we're just going to say the time he was born, it would be easy to estimate that there could be over 750 million people on the world. And it wasn't very long. Yes, you're right. They were all going to end up being destroyed. Now think about this for just a second. We know God says that Noah was the righteous one. So that means 7,773,912,761 other people were evil. Um, hey, Mindy, is the world that bad? No, we're not quite there, are we? We're not going to be flooded anytime soon. Yes, you're right. Now, realistically, this was just a guess, right? We don't know how many kids they had. We don't have any clue. They could have been more prolific. They could have been less prolific. It's tradition, it's a Jewish tradition that says that Adam and Eve had 25 kids, 12 sets of kids. And the reality is, this is actually probably that's a pretty conservative number. I mean, if they're living 900 and some odd years, you can have a lot of kids in 900 years. 24 may be way too conservative, would it not? Right. Yeah. Well, they may have had, women may have had a time clock, but it might have been 750 years or so. You know, I'm waiting and, hey, you know, eh. <laughs> no birth control. No. But is it easy to see how maybe God might have looked on the world and if he saw only one out of Enish calling God, he walks with God, Noah, his dad gives him a good name at least, right? There's a little hope in that, but the reality is the world is not a good place. Yeah. Okay, so we don't have any stories of women dying in childbirth. That could be a reality. It might be, it might not be. What if we take this number and remember there was that whole Lamech guy who had two wives? 
Do you think he only had 24 kids? Even if he only had two wives, it's probably looking at more like 36 or 48. You know, we don't know when this reality of, of when humanity had degraded to the point to where children might die in childbirth. We know that that's because oftentimes a child dies in childbirth because something is wrong. Either something in the child, some, maybe the, the mother has ingested a food or something that caused the body to just reject the child. There are many different reasons, but almost always it's because something is wrong. And that's another sign of the brokenness in humanity, is it not? I don't think God wants that. I don't think God causes that. I think it's a reality of the broken condition of humanity. And I don't know ex when exactly that comes into play. Um, you know, I think somewhere here in Genesis, we'll probably hear stories of women who are struggling with that reality. But it may not have been a reality at all before the flood. And so it may, you know, we're just talking about one couple as if everybody's got fidelity in marriage and everybody's faithful and nobody takes on a second spouse and nobody sleeps around. And I mean, this here is probably conservative number. It would be easy to estimate that we could have more people on the world at the time of Noah than we have on the world today. Can you see that? I mean, it's conceivable. First of all, as a dad, I wouldn't want to try and feed that many mouths. As a mom, you probably wouldn't want to try and raise that many kids. The four we had were bad enough and they were good kids. I simply point this out to say the story of Noah and the flood is far more catastrophic than that story I got told as a kid in nursery school where you see a handful of people in the water floating around. The reality of the evil in the world is probably far more profound than what I wanted to think about as a kid. If there are millions upon millions of people and most of them, 99.99999% of them are evil. And it's an evil world, is it not? Now, the other side of that is there may not be that many people because they probably killed most of them off. Because let's face it, they're evil, right? Sometimes even just a simple math exercise can put things into a different perspective, can't it? This story we're getting ready to read here in Genesis chapter 6 is far bigger in scope. Even though we call it a worldwide flood, and in our head we understand what that means, do we really understand what that means? I've heard people ask me the question, what, what does it really take to grieve God? How far do you have to fall? Well, apparently you have to fall over 750, mil 750 million people being evil. That's about what it takes to get God pretty angry. Just, just throwing that out there. So do you think that maybe if you admit that you've done some wrong and you turn to him, he might be willing to forgive that? I mean, you're not 750 million people, are you? You're not the evil that 750 million people could do. I mean, Enoch walked with God, remember? And was no more. God rewarded him for turning to him and walking with him. Any final thoughts? Because I don't want to get too far into the Noah story because that's next. Week. Any questions? I want to leave that up there for thought. And um, I have a, a color chart I've made over the years uh, that kind of goes through the years and it kind of plots the people. I'll make sure to give it. I think if someone will remind me next week, I'll even send out the link again and I'll attach that as a PDF so you can have a picture of it and, and we'll have that for you guys. I may have to go now and augment it because I may want to go back through and add along to the side Haynes generations to see who partnered beside each other. But anybody have any value in this? 
All right, numbers people who like this. Any non-number people who are like, man, what is all the deal with the numbers? <laughs> Crystal says yes. <laughs> Mandy says, no, no more numbers for me. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, your word tells us that you are slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. We cannot begin to imagine how evil the world must have been that you felt compelled to do something different. And Lord, we pray that somehow we are different, that we walk in that spiritual heritage of Seth, that we call on you like Enosh, that we walk with you like Enoch. And Lord, that we could live worthy of the gift you've given us in Jesus Christ. Lord, may our world be different. May we learn from these mistakes. And Lord, may the world see you in us. And may they want that for themselves. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Sorry for the rough start with the technology side, but I'm hoping that it's recorded. I'm going to stop this and hopefully it will.